Vayetze Yako Mibir Shava Vayelech Achorana Vayivka Bamoko Vayolen Shom Kivo Hashemesh Vayikach Meavne Hamoko Vayosem Mirash Osov Vayishkav Bamoko Haho This weekly parasha is called Vayetze and it continues with the life of Jacob. When Jacob departed from Beersheba, that's how the parasha starts uh, in Genesis 28, verse 10. Jacob has created lots of troubles for himself, and that's why Rivka had to send him to her family, back to her brother Laban, as a refuge, although, of course, the excuse for this was that uh, Jacob needed to get married uh, to the right woman, and it was a sort of a contrast with <coughs> Esau, who married the uh, Canaanite women, and his parents weren't happy. So this type of uh, excuse did have a double portion. The only problem was that differently from uh, the marriage of Isaac, for whom Eliezer brought to the uh, Haran lots of gifts as a bride price for Rivka, Jacob left empty-handed. However, when he arrived at Haran, Laban took him in. Because Laban was a clever man. Laban, Laban realized that the big clan in this economy brings the material blessings. And even though Jacob had no material means to pay the bride price, Laban knew that behind him was another part of the family which he probably thought to bring together. This is why instead of rejecting Jacob, he made Jacob work for his wife. As we know, Jacob falls in love with Rachel, who is described as beautiful while her sister Leah is described as a weak in eyes, which is very strange. Uh, Torah is not a great descriptor of the human portraits. We don't have a portrait of any of the patriarchs. And that's why the description of Leah as weak in eyes <coughs> is a little bit dubious. But in the ancient economy, it was a very important characteristic. Um, in the ancient Mesopotamian household, everybody had to work and had its role. While men were herders and uh, uh, they uh, plowed the land, the women were making crafts, which is a very sensitive, delicate job which required a good eyesight. Uh, it was very important business in training girls to make crafts to the extent that some rich man would adopt a girl from the uh, poor family, paid some money to the father of that girl, would train this girl in different crafts and arts and then would marry her out, making their investment double. We have the records, ancient records of adoption from Nuzi that talk about that. That's why Leah was a bad, a big problem for Laban who couldn't marry her out to anywhere. But Jacob wanted Rachel. But Laban needed to get rid of Leah. That's why after seven years, 
Laban observed Jacob and decided to move on a trek. He decided to make a feast, after which he switched the brides. It's very interesting. How could it happen? Just like this. Well, it looks like Jacob fell into the trap similar to what he had made to his brother. He became the victim of his temper, which under the influence of alcohol, as Rashi said, Jacob was fairly drunk after the feast. He didn't even say the word to his beloved wife and didn't hear a thing from her. After he wakes up, he sees that he got a wrong wife. God has really showed to Jacob that, you know, this is something he has to deal with. But Jacob wasn't really satisfied with that. And he decided to keep getting Rachel. In fact, Laban even gave Rachel to Jacob as an advance, which is very unusual. Because usually the father of the bride does not want the husband to take a second wife. And in this case, even in the Torah, it's very clear that marrying two sisters is uh, against any law of God. But in Jacob's case, this has happened. And it took a very bad consequences. Because... Even though Torah formally does not prohibit uh, polygamy, God shows the consequences, which were really bad at this time. God immediately shows who is the real wife of Jacob. In fact, even in the Torah, we don't have a formal marital ceremony, right, to indicate the consummation of marriage, because according to the Torah mentality, the woman with whom you slept is, in fact, your wife. This is why Leah has become a legal wife of Jacob, and she started to bear the sons. But in the same way, as in the previous Torah portion, we indicated the favoritism of Isaac to Esau and and Rivka to Jacob, we have the echo of this type of upbringing in the life of Jacob. In uh, uh, Genesis 29, verse 30, it says here, Then Jacob went into Rachel, and indeed, he loved Rachel more than Leah. That was the problem. Because Leah saw that she is not loved. And we have a family tragedy starting right here. Leah finds the outlet of her rejection in her bearing the sons. The first one, Ru'uban, God has seen my problem. Shimon, the second one, God has heard, I was heard. This son is the result of me being heard. Levi, I want to be attached to my husband. Maybe after the third son, my husband will realize that I am his wife because Rachel remains barren. You see the suffering of this woman who becomes a victim of her father's treachery. Yehuda, the praising of God 
four sons were born to Leah, thus God indicating that he is behind it. That he is showing that Leah is, in fact, the wife of Jacob. And Rachel remains barren. And she becomes impatient. And even the love which Jacob had to her turns a little bit bitter. Because something is not normal. Jacob isn't happy. The next chapter turns the family of Jacob upside down into a big mess because two sisters began to fight with each other over the bed of Jacob. And they start competing each other with the birth of the surrogate children through their maidservants. And in fact, Jacob ended with four wives, not with two. In chapter 30, we have even the children involved in this treachery and the fight for the husband's bed, it really becomes ugly. What to do in this situation? Jacob seemed to be like a sheep that lost control of the rudder in the hurricane. He was tossed back and forth between four women who needed him it wasn't normal life. It wasn't a good upbringing of the children. It was a big mess. The mess which often we get in our lives. And only the mercy of God pulls Jacob out of that. God is merciful. This is the only thing we can tell about God in this story. Because in the middle of everything, in the middle of this mess, in the middle of this chaos, Rachel bears Joseph. And when Joseph is born, Jacob remembers his mission. Jacob remembers that he is the descendant of Abraham, whom God sent out there to the land of Canaan. In spite of the fact that he knows that in the land of Canaan, he has absolutely nothing. Even as a part of Laban's clan, he has not very much. Even though he becomes a blessing for Laban as Laban notices here in the parasha, I kind of learned that God blesses me through you. That's in Genesis 30, verse 27. But Jacob remembers his role and his mission. And that's why he decides to go against all the odds. He has nothing so far. But God blesses him. The second blessing is that God acts against the genetics. And even though Jacob asked Laban to take only the spotted and striped animals from the flock, these spotted and striped animals in Laban knew that they are much more rare in the uh, litter. But Jacob has acquired lots of wealth and lots of flock. And with that, he is going back. And that's all what he has. Because all inheritance of Abram, material inheritance of Abram, that equivalent of the billion dollars doesn't belong to him. Esau has it, and Jacob has nothing. 
Jacob sets on a move. But Rachel isn't really happy about it. She isn't happy over the fact that after all these 20 years of hard labor of Jacob for her father Laban, Laban has not given Jacob any stake in his property or inheritance. That's why Rachel, before they started moving, take this little idols from the house of Laban. These idols were not just an idols to be worshipped. They were a titles to the property. Today, archaeologists have found many of these little figurines with some writings on there that indicate the value of the property and proprietors. These titles, uh, some of them could be just a seals where a good legal documents in a court. And that's why Lebanon was really worried where did they go. They started the chase. And when he doesn't, he, when he reaches Jacob and his family and fails to find this figurine, he is still worried. The worry is the fact that at any point, Jacob could come back to the Haran or any of the descendants of Jacob, if they have this figurine, could come back to Haran and claim the rights to the property in court. That wasn't very good for Laban and for his sons. This is why the treaty is established and Jacob and Laban enter into the agreement. They build a hip, which is a heap uh, out of stones, and they say in Genesis 31, verse 52, this heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness that I will not pass by this heap to you for harm, or, and you will not pass by this pillar to me. In English translation, it says for harm just because the translation seems to be not sure why is this limitation for passing. And in some ways, yeah, it's true, for harm. But something else is implied here. Definitely Laban doesn't want Jacob or his descendants back into his property. He realizes that his idea of building a mega clan and bringing Abraham's descendants back into one family in the same fashion it was under uh, his grandfather Terah is not realistic. This is why he decides to demarcate the border between Two nations. In fact, that building of the heap is a fulfillment of what we studied in Parasha Lech Lecha. When God promised to Abraham that the nation will come out of Abraham, new nation, this new nation is formed. Jacob is, in fact, become an Israel at the time of his struggle with God. The new nation is formed. If Abraham crosses Euphrates as just a family, just individual, Jacob crosses a family with his family as a new nation. He cannot go back. 
Abraham could send his servant for Rivka back to his family. That border shows there is no more family connection. Two nations are separated. On the east bank of Euphrates, there is Aramean nation of Syria, while in the land of Canaan, the new nation, the nation of Israel is formed. Not just the Hebrews. The Hebrew was Abraham with his band. Jacob has no people from that group because everybody who stayed with Abraham and Isaac eventually is with Esau. Jacob comes with his four wives and 12 children and starts everything anew. Yes, this is the controversy. Attention here. Between the mistakes of Jacob and the blessings which God gave him regardless of all the odds. This is why the prophet Hosea in the, in the chapter 13 uh, is chosen as a haftarah for this particular Torah portion. Why the rabbis choose this passage as a haftarah? It says here, from verse 9. It is your destruction, Israel, that you are against me, against your help. There is, where now is your king that may save you in all your cities and your judges of whom you requested? I gave you king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is stored up. Hosea is a prophet that was sent to the northern kingdom of Israel at, right at the time of its destruction by the Assyrian kingdom. Right before the time when ten tribes of Israel are, will be gone to their captivity and will be dispersed forever and ever. Hosea is the last prophet that speaks to those ten tribes and talks about the iniquity of Ephraim as the largest tribe of Israel uh, being bound up. Nevertheless, with all the problems, verse 14 ends with God's mercy. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem from the death? Or death, where is your thorns? Or Sheol, where is your sting? It's interesting how in the life of Jacob we have two manifestations of God. Rabbis saw that God manifests himself in two distinct patterns and fashions. They call the first one Midat Hadin and the second one is Midat Rachamim. Midat Hadin is a manifestation or mode of justice, while Midat Rachamim is the mode of mercy. This is the same tension as which Christians often contemplate when they talk about the law and grace. The same tension existed not only in the New Testament and in the life of Jacob, God clearly manifested both Midat Hadin and Midat Rachamim. On the one hand, God has 
put Jacob under the circumstances for which he paid dearly by actually having the same situation to express his temper, which actually had much more severe consequences. Because when Esau sold his birthright, it was... It didn't have any consequences. He received the inheritance. But when Jacob had married the person he didn't intend, he had lived with those consequences for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, God was merciful by blessing Jacob because Jacob wanted those blessings. As God promised to him in the very beginning. When he said to Jacob in Genesis 28, 15. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you forever. Wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that, that I have promised you. Jacob claimed these promises when he fought with an angel at the river Yarmouk, and God was faithful to his promises. Regardless of all Jacob misgiven, God in his mode of justice, in his mode of mercy, gave Jacob his blessings. Interestingly enough, that when Hosea in Aftarah talks about God's mercy, he is turning this idea into from the only earthly realities into the heavenly reality. O oh, death, where is your thorns? These same words are used in the book of First Corinthians when Paul talks about the resurrection from the dead. In the verse 54 and 55 of chapter 15, he quotes Hosea and says... But when this perishable will have put in the Im imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about saying that this is written, death is swallowed up in victory or death. Where is your victory or death? Where is your sting? The resurrection and eternity. Interestingly enough, Rabbis saw this connection between the Parsha and Haftarah, the Midat Rahamim, the mode of mercy of God, is the important component of how God brings about salvation. <laughs>